Hello. This presentation covers the identification of the commoner species of dragonflies and damselflies found in Britain. Now Britain's 45 breeding species of dragonflies and damselflies are a speck in the ocean compared with the global list, but nevertheless it does make them a manageable group to start identifying. And here we're going to look at the 24 most common species, uh, those that occur more widely across the country. Now I'm going to cover their identification and status, their range and what their habitats are. If you want a, a more general introduction to dragonflies and damselflies and, and their biology, then please look at the video presentation entitled An Introduction to Britain's Dragonflies. And the less common species are found in another YouTube video, Britain's Dragonflies Uncommon Species. And you can find these either on my channel or on the British Dragonfly Society's YouTube channel. They're based and draw heavily on this wonderful book, Britain's Dragonflies, now in its fourth edition, published by Princeton Wild Guides. Now clearly I'm going to be talking about both damselflies and dragonflies, and these can be rather conveniently um, put into a dozen different groupings, six damselflies and six dragonflies. So these 12 basic types include, on the damselfly side, the large and rather colourful demoiselles, which have patterned wings, the tiny little blue tails, which pretty much do what they say on the tin, the spread wings or emerald damselflies, which usually hold their wings open. The blue damsels, a confusing bunch, but two common ones dealt with here, also known as bluets. We have a couple of red damsel species, one of which is common and widespread and the other rare and local. And then we have two moderately common red-eye damselflies, red-eyed damselflies to deal with. On the dragonfly side, we have the chasers with their dark wing bases. We have the two species of skimmers with blue abdomens in the males, perching low on the ground. We have the darters, which are also perchers. So chasers, skimmers and darters perch have territorial perches and they use those both to catch food from but also to find mates and chase off other males. By contrast the large and powerful hawkers and emperors are flyers so these spend a lot of their time patrolling on territory or flying around catching food. Um, there's a convenient grouping of golden ring and club tail which are black and yellow, and the emeralds, which um, are generally localised, if not rare. So for this presentation, I'm not going to deal with the emeralds or the club tail because these are scarce local species, but I will be talking about the rest. So let's just refresh our minds. We've got uh, 14 common species of Anisoptera or true dragonflies and we've got 10 common species of damselflies or Zygoptera. Here's a, a list of the damselfly species and their alternative names um, breeding in the UK. So I'm looking at the 10 commonest out of 20 species and those scarce or rare ones which I'm going to cover in the other presentation, the rarer species presentation, are shaded in grey. And we also have one rare species that uh, up to 2022 has only occurred twice in Britain 
the common winter damsel. We're going to look at the 14 commonest of 25 dragonfly species. Again, the scarce and rare ones are shaded in grey. And we have a couple of, um, well, we have a, a whole bunch, sorry, of uh, migrants and vagrants that have also occurred that I'm not covering here. In 2021, the British Dragonfly Society published The State of Dragonflies, which was the result of a 50 year uh, data analysis of all of the dragonfly records in Britain and Ireland. And just picking out some of the data from this exercise helps us to identify the more common species. So here we've got ranked the 24 most widespread species of dragonflies and damselflies based on the number of one kilometer squares or monads that they occupied. So blue tail damselfly, common dart, a common blue damselfly, these are our most widespread species. In terms of their changes over that 50 year period, there were some quite significant increases um, on, on the part of, for example, emperor dragonfly, migrant hawker, which uh, spread considerably. The map in the middle, incidentally, gives you an idea of species richness, so how many different species occur um, across the country with concentrations in the south and the east of England in particular. Okay, so let's first look at the demoiselles. We have two species. The banded demoiselle does what it says on the tin, really. It has a band across the wings in the male. Uh, this species is found along slow flowing waters, usually those with a muddy bottom that the larvae are associated with. The other common Demoiselle species is the beautiful demoiselle. This is most common in the west of Britain because it frequents fast flowing, often gravelly or stony bottomed rivers and streams. And if we compare the distributions of those, you'll see hopefully what I mean. The banded demoiselle is associated principally with the lowlands and the beautiful with the uh, often upland, faster flowing streams in the south and west. Those uh, phenograms or phenology charts at the bottom give an indication of when the species are most likely to be found. There will be some differences depending on how far north you are with things generally flying later then. But these give a, a basic indication of when the main flight periods are. The females are differentiated by their wing colour. They're identified by again being large and rather floppy flyers, but they have a white false wing spot. It's a wing spot um, that's not a true pterostigma, but nevertheless that helps to identify them. And as you can see, their wings are coloured, shaded green in the case of banded demoiselle, which can make them quite difficult to spot in waterside vegetation. The beautiful demoiselle, bronzy coloured wings. And both males and females are quite prone to wandering, perhaps males more so than females. And you will often encounter these species some distance from running waters. The white leg damselfly or blue feather leg is um, a rather unusual blue damselfly in that it's mostly associated with flowing waters, typically uh, lowland rivers with muddy bottoms and quite luxuriant vegetation growing up from out of the mud. They are named because of the white tibiae, the expanded white legs 
They also have black areas where the other blue damsels are blue. And instead of, instead of a, a spur, as in the azure damselfly on the side of the thorax, they have what I call a hockey stick. So it's quite long and joins up to the black line above it. They also have an orange wing spot, which again is different to the blue damsels, which basically have dark wing spots. The females are very pale, often almost white in colour, and are usually um, flying low through riverside vegetation. The distribution is quite localised and particularly in the southwest of their range, um, very localised. They're prone to wandering like most species associated with rivers and streams, like the demoiselles, for example, they're quite prone to wandering away from water, so they can turn up a kilometre or more away from their breeding sites. And they tend to be a, a midsummer, late spring through to late summer species. The azure damselfly is our common damselfly of small ponds and ditches. Now you can see here a pair laying eggs in tandem, which is uh, one of their characteristics, uh, along with other blue damsels, uh, but not generally the common blue or the blue tails. So as you can see from the distribution map, it's very widespread. And in fact, it is increasing in the north and moving into new locations in Scotland. But it's a very common damselfly in many locations, particularly from April, May onwards. The common blue damselfly, on, uh, in contrast, um, has in the male and also in the female some characteristic markings. So one of the most important things to look for on these is the width of the blue or pale stripe on the top of the thorax and also the lack of a black mark, a line, a spur if you like, on the side of the thorax that the azure damselfly carries. As you can see from the map it is very widespread in fact it is um, found in all parts of the UK and wanders far away from water so you'll even find this commonly in, in dry locations. Now let's focus in a bit more closely on this pair of bluets, the blue damsels. The azure damselfly I've um, often referred to as the snooker player. You have to use your imagination a little bit on this, but the snooker player um, has several features. First of all, not actually related to snooker, there is a very narrow blue stripe on top of the thorax compared with the common blue damselfly in which it's much broader. So this blue stripe is no bigger than the black stripe below it. In true uh, snooker player fashion, it carries a bow tie, a dicky bow on the ninth abdominal segment. It's a little bit variable in shape, but usually a little bit like a dicky bow. It's holding a beer glass, so on its second abdominal segment, it has a black U-shape, a square U-shape, rather like a pint glass. Going back to the common blue, look at those big, wide blue stripes on the top of the thorax, and a completely unmarked terminal blue patch, so no sticky bow or bow tie shape. And there's an apple or mushroom shape on segment two, quite unlike the black square U shape shown on the azure. So here we go, the azure, as well as carrying its beer glass and its bow tie, also has what you could think of as a billiard cue. So it has this spur 
this black marking on the side of the thorax. Compare that with a common blue, which has those, again, the broad stripe, um, but lack of a spur on the side. And again, if we look at the tail end of these, the um, ninth abdominal segment has a black marking towards the tip on azure, whereas on common blue, we have two completely blue segments. So generally, you see more blue on the common blue because of the more uh, extensive blue on the thorax, as well as that little bit extra towards the tip of the abdomen. And with practice, you can often see these. You'll get an impression sometimes with the naked eye, but confirming it with close focus binoculars will usually help. Turning to the females now, female damselflies are always a little bit trickier than the males, but around um, ponds and, and rivers, 90% of what you'll see will be male anyway. The females are always harder to find, um, less conspicuous, of course, as well. But here we've got the females of azure and common blue damselflies. And I think you'll perhaps appreciate some differences here. Again, the female common blue mirroring the broad stripe on the thorax and the unmarked side without that black spur. There are rather arrow sh uh, shaped or um, I always think of these as rocket shapes in black going down the abdomen. Um, beware that the base colour of both common blue and azure changes. Some are blue, as in these, others are duller or even um, browner or olive. Let's move on now to the blue-tailed damselfly. The blue-tailed damselfly, again, does what it says on the tin. It has a blue tail, although it's a subterminal segment. It's actually the eighth segment along the abdomen. Um, but the characteristic of the blue tail is it's got these two-tone pterostigmas, the black and white um, wing spots, very different to other of, of the common damsels, which have um, a single colour, but usually dark in the case of the blues. Not quite so obvious on the hind wing and less common, less obvious also, less contrasting on the, the female blue tails. But there's that blue segment just shifted up from the tip of the abdomen. Females come in a rather confusing array of colours. The um, thorax colour changes as well with age, with maturity. And although many of the forms have that blue segment, eight, that the males have, some don't. And beware, there are some very confusing forms with only a slightly paler segment eight compared with the uh, these others which have a more conspicuous blue segment. Blue tail damselflies also mate for extended periods. Um, I think on one occasion um, several hours was measured. So you're quite often going to see a pair of these mating. The, uh, the fact that they mate for a long time means it, you're more likely to detect them in this, uh, in this form. And often in late afternoons, prior to females going off alone to lay their eggs. You can see this female has a, a rather dull segment nine rather than the blue cell. And again, a widespread distribution and a long flight period and frequenting quite a lot of habitats, not necessarily in pristine ecological condition. So there you go. Mates for longer than other species. So if you've got a pair of damselflies mating, particularly in the afternoon, there's a good chance there'll be blue tails. And if you're not sure, just have a look at the wing spots. Now the large red is the earliest of the damselflies to appear. 
occasionally at the end of March, but more typically in April, and we'll be flying in the lowlands throughout much of the spring and early part of the summer. In the, uh, the highlands and higher up um, in altitude, then you will see them later on into the summer, into August, for example. So the male large red has black legs, black wing spots, and also some rather difficult to see black markings towards the tip of the abdomen. They're difficult to see because they're shiny and bronzy and in strong sunlight, they're not always very obvious. So don't be misled into thinking you've got the rarer small red damselfly, which actually is quite a bit smaller and uh, has pinky red legs and wing spots and a completely red abdomen. So remember, the small red is all red. The large red does have black legs, black wing spot. The females come in several forms, as do other female damselflies. And in the case of the large red, there's a variation in the amount of black visible on the abdomen. This, this is a, a pretty typical one with some yellow between the abdominal segments, as well as um, a varying amount of black. There is a form with all dark segments and there is a rare form with all red segments. Okay, the red eyes, the red eyed damselfly um, has a very dark top to its thorax. Dark eyes, which are in fact bright red, if you can see them well in good sunlight. Um, but also another important feature is the blue segments right at the tip of the abdomen. Um, unlike the blue tail, for example, the blue tail damselfly has segment eight blue and segments nine and 10 are black. So here we've got the segments, blue segments right at the tip. And the thing about red eyes, as in this one, is they like to perch on floating vegetation. So here it's on a water lily, but it could be a pond weed and occasionally other types of vegetation, including occasionally floating algae or even floating leaves if there's nothing else to perch on. But they're usually associated with ponds and slow flowing rivers with water lilies. The male is quite handsome when you can see those red eyes. The abdomen often has um, some pruinescence, so that's a, a waxy substance that can come through the cuticle and, uh, uh, and cover the black in a slightly greyish hint down most of the abdomen in this specimen. The females, not quite so easy to identify. They have reddish brown eyes and probably the most characteristic thing if you get a good view, is the blue divisions between the dark segments towards the tip of the abdomen. It's quite a localized um, dragonfly, but still um, fairly widespread and common where it does occur. It tends to be rather more scarce and scattered in the west of its distribution. Since 1999, the UK has been invaded by several um, species, including the small red-eyed damselfly, which is, as the name suggests, the smaller and uh, slighter built red-eye. It's also often seen out over water on floating plants or algae. And there are a number of differences that you can look for, but one in particular um, through binoculars. Uh, the side of segment eight has a blue wedge, which is lacking in the red-eyed damselfly. There is also a, a black um, cross mark on the terminal segment, if you can see it from above, but that's not easy to see. It tends not to have the pruinescence that we see on male red-eyed damselflies, so tends to be black. The female, um, rather difficult to identify, to be honest, um, one of the more difficult species, um, but often seen uh, with males 
over the water in um, mating position, in the wheel position, or egg laying, dunking its uh, abdomen under the water, or even going underwater to lay eggs. As you can see, a, a southeasterly distribution still, but expanding northwards. Um, this map was produced uh, about in about 2018, and there have, has been further spread northwards and westwards since then. So one to be keeping an eye open for. It's particularly uh, important to remember that this species uh, is rarely seen before the end of June. The red eye damselfly flies from May, June into August. Um, so there is an overlap, but this species is rarely seen in numbers until July or August. So the emerald damselfly or common spreadwing is the damselfly that breaks the rules by typically holding its wings out at about 60 degrees to the abdomen. Um, you can see here a, a pair um, actually in the process of starting to lay eggs. Um, the male at the top has that uh, beautiful glossy green iridescent green bronze top to its thorax and most of its abdomen with powder blue prurino, prurinose uh, areas at the base and the tip of the abdomen. Female tends to be more bronzy than green with um, the yellowish underparts and sides, but quite robust. Both of these are quite large damselflies. You can see again there the powder blue areas. And another widespread species, but one that has been in decline according to the uh, State of Dragonflies report. Another late season species, so the last of the damselflies to emerge, typically in late June and July. So uh, being around in, in good numbers at the end of summer. And a range of habitats, but mostly in ponds and boggy areas in the uplands. Four spotted chaser is named because it has uh, four extra black spots on its wings. So as well as those towards the tip, there are dots halfway along the, the nodes. The chasers all have dark colouring at the base of their wings, particularly on the hind wings. And the four spotted chaser shows these well. This is uh, a fairly young one and still has quite a lot of golden colour along the front of the wings. This disappears with age and indeed that rather bright um, fulvous abdomen will go uh, darker with age. It's unusual in that male and female are essentially similar in, in pattern, in coloration. Occasionally we see a form which has even more black uh, spreading back from the spots at the wingtips, so even more black on the wings with these. And it's uh, another species like the emerald damselfly of uh, a wide range of habitats, um, mostly standing waters and in particular boggy areas. And it flies um, in fair abundance across much of the country from spring through to the end of summer. Here's a male broad-bodied chaser. So there are differences between the sexes in this species. Like the four spot, it has those um, dark patches at the base of the wings. And as it says on the tin, it has a broad body, a broad abdomen. Um, very expanded but depressed um, 
uh, looked at from the side it's not a bulging abdomen in that sense it's quite uh, slim has the dark wing bases and here a female female actually with slightly deformed hind wings but still able to fly uh, sharing the, the male's dark wing bases and this lovely um, fulvous abdomen with yellow spots along the sides. A mainly southern species and an early flyer uh, emerging in April May and uh, sometimes seen later in, in the summer but also prone to wandering and finding new waters it's very keen on new ponds, uh, waters with not a lot of vegetation. Now rather similar to the broad-bodied chaser at first glance, the black-tailed skimmer is actually very different. Firstly, it's not a percher, it likes to sit on the ground. So here on a piece of wood, but it could be on bare ground very often. It certainly shares the blue abdomen in the case of the male, although the black-tailed skimmer, as you might suspect, has that black tip to the abdomen. It, however, unlike the chasers, lacks a black wing base, so the skimmers don't have a black wing base. Here's a female black-tailed skimmer, and this is what the males look like as well when they're immature, before the blue essence has come out on the abdomen. So they start off black and yellow with a ladder type pattern in black down the abdomen. They also have, as do other skimmers, yellow antinodal veins. These are the tiny little veins coming back from the front of the wing and in some lights they're very conspicuous and a really good skimmer feature. The black-tailed skimmer is pretty widespread, at least in the south of Britain, and it has expanded its range northwards quite considerably in recent decades. It's a midsummer species and can be found in some numbers at times over lakes, uh, particularly old mineral working, so flooded gravel pits, for example. And uh, it's also found at, at ponds and canals and, and large ditches but it does seem to like the presence of bare ground around the margins where it can sit and bask. The Keot skimmer, by contrast, is really a wet heathland specialty. It likes these boggy areas, often with, with bog mosses, and uh, are found on heathland and, and moorland. So although it's fairly widespread and is included in this presentation, it's highly localised. It does wander occasionally and appears outside typical habitats. Here the male you can see has got those um, yellow antinodal veins, but also yellow costa, the yellow forewing vein, vein at the front of the, each wing. And it has a more or less completely blue abdomen. So the keel that gives it its name is, is a dark line, a dark ridge down the top of the abdomen. And uh, once it's fully coloured up, um, there is no obvious black tip as the black-tailed skimmer has. Keeled skimmer also has um, orange wing spots, which uh, differ from the black wing spots of the black-tailed skimmer. Again, it's not a chaser, so it has no dark in the wing bases. And it also has that dark line, that dark ridge down the centre of the abdomen, giving it the keeled name. The distribution map, as you can see, is very patchy. It's principally a westerly species associated with heathland and bogs, and uh, much more locally in, in other parts of England. The female 
Keel skimmer tends to be rather richly ochery coloured and quite well camouflaged on heathland, so not always easy to spot. She has um, rather more exaggerated dark keel, but also pairs of spots either side of, of the keel. Uh, there is a spot on each segment. It has those yellow antinodal veins, which are a good feature if you're confusing it perhaps with a female darter. And sometimes it has quite prominent straw coloured stripes down the top of the thorax. Moving on now to the darters. The common darter is one of our commonest and most widespread small dragonflies, typically around ponds in late summer and into the autumn. It's one of our latest flying species, very occasionally even found into December. The males have typically an orange-red abdomen, but Throughout most of their lives, they sport these two large yellow patches on the side of the thorax. The legs will always, if you look close enough, be seen to have a pale stripe. It may not be always that conspicuous, but often it's a yellowish stripe. Here's a pair egg laying in tandem, which is how they often lay eggs, not invariably. The female here has become reddish, that happens sometimes with these, but more typically they're a, a yellowy brown colour. And the map there again shows its very widespread distribution with that late season appearance. So typically at their commonest in August and September. Now the colour changes that dragonflies go through as they mature and become old can be quite confusing. So here I've shown on the left males and on the right females. At the top young ones, so tenrils soon after they've emerged and before they colour up. At the bottom left a male has got his orangey red abdomen and on the right this female as she's aged has become rather dull in colour and uh, if anything, rather brownish yellow. However, as they get even older still, further changes may occur. Females may become red on the abdomen and males may get um, a suffusion in the wings and the abdomen may go a little bit pink rather than orangey red. Common daughters are also very keen on heat, uh, basking in into the autumn months on usually wood, but occasionally, as you can see, on human beings. And these came in um, onto my person, really, without any um, encouragement. They just found that heat and liked it. As the uh, summer and autumn progress, Common darters become increasingly interested in basking anywhere where they can get heat from, for example, a piece of wood, a log, or a fence post, or a bench, or in the case of this wonderful one, um, a British Dragonfly Society logo on a hat. Now contrast the common darter with the ruddy darter, which is less widespread. It is really a deeper red, a ruddy colour all over. So, um, but one of the key features of both males and females are the black legs. They are solid black. There's no pale stripe down them. They do have this blood red, often rather wasted abdomen. So um, narrowing part way down and then bulging out towards the tip more conspicuously than common darters do. And they also have um, quite reddish thorax, especially the eyes, 
and a pink face, if you like. So a lot of red on a, on a male ruddy darter. The female um, shares those black legs, shares, apart from that, the same basic coloration as the female common darter, although the black across the top of the face does extend down the sides alongside the eyes, which it doesn't in the common data. And there's also a black T shape if you look down on the thorax, um, the black down the centre spreads out behind the head into a, a sort of T shape. Ruddy data much more localised than the common data and uh, has a rather peculiar distribution, disappearing in parts of the west of its range. Um, it doesn't go on into the autumn as late by any means as common data and is more typically a late summer species. Of ponds, ditches, um, sometimes large lakes and canals. Now onto the hawkers, the southern hawker. And uh, this, this is a male southern hawker. And hawkers can be quite confusing, even when you have them at rest like this one, which is not always a, um, a luxury. Very often you're seeing these in flight. They do what the name says, they hawk seemingly without resting, but every so often they will need to go away and feed, um, hang up, have a rest. So the, uh, the things to look for when they do land, sometimes you can see these in flight, but in the case of the southern hawker, what I call headlights, so big pale patches on the top of the thorax. They have a, a yellow golf tee shape at the base of the abdomen, not always easy to see unless you're seeing it flat on. And then at the tip of the abdomen, two completely blue segments. So they extend right across those terminal segments, giving you what I call tail lights. So Southern Hawker has headlights on main beam, as it were, and tail lights showing. And you can see that these are visible even on a, a territorial male in flight. Um, and you do often with Southern Hawker, get a decent view of them because they are quite territorial and they will approach you if you go into their territory on the edge of a pond. They will come up and have a look at you. So they'll hover at sort of waist height. Even occasionally they'll come um, from a garden pond and investigate a conservatory, for example, if the door's left over. So quite inquisitive creatures, quite bold and beautifully coloured. Female is uh, a dark chocolate and uh, limey green or pale yellow colour, but with the same markings as the male. She has the uh, com continuous um, pale markings across the tip of those abdominal segments and the main beam headlights and golf tee pattern. Um, more of a southerly distribution, as its name suggests, although it has expanded its range into northern England and into Scotland in recent years. And like the other hawkers, it's a late season species. So although they may emerge in May or June, they will disappear for a couple of weeks off to woodland where they feed up and then they come back to ponds, to wetland areas to breed in August, September time, even sometimes into October or November. But often found around wooded ponds and you may encounter the females laying eggs, particularly into moss and wood around the edges of a pond. Here's one laying eggs into a piece of rotten wood. Well above the water line in this case. The brown hawker has a more restricted distribution, although it is found in Ireland. And here a female is also laying eggs into rotten wood. And um, 
she's sporting um, mostly brown coloration but that lovely golden brown color in the wings so a really brown species with those two conspicuous pale yellow markings on the side of the thorax but overall basically a brown creature the emperor dragonfly or blue emperor which is quite an appropriate name for it is our biggest common dragonfly and often to be seen hawking seemingly without resting for hours on end over ponds it keeps its distance it won't come close to you it'll often be a few meters out from the edge of the pond and it will hawk at something like shoulder height so quite high uh, over a pond so pretty conspicuous creatures over much of the summer the males have conspicuous blue sides to the abdomen and a greenish thorax plain green thorax there is this irregular dark line down the top of the blue abdomen but when you're seeing them from side on you see mainly blue and green blue on the abdomen green on the thorax quite often there is a slight droop to the abdomen and you may also get a hint of the yellow costa those wing veins at the front of each wing female emperor here are uh, looking rather like the male although in many cases they will be duller versions of the male they lay eggs by perching on floating vegetation and injecting eggs into the pondweed stems or leaves quite a, a substantial increase in the range of emperor dragonflies in recent decades as this trend line shows over the 50 years from 1970 it's a, a midsummer species and is petering out by the end of summer before the hawkers really come into their own the migrant hawker is the common hawker of late summer these days um, particularly in the south of Britain the migrant name comes from an era when it was mostly a migrant but it has bred increasingly and spread northwards over the last 50 years so many of our migrant hawkers are now homebred it's a small hawker and is found in the autumn months particularly from um, August onwards it's our latest emerging dragonfly um, mainly occurring in the lowlands so not to be confused for example with the badly named common hawker that occurs mostly on heathland and moorland migrant hawker often found in numbers around reedy lakes and ponds and uh, it's non-territorial so you will see numbers of them together unlike other hawkers which are rather fiercely territorial so you tend only to see odd ones of them males on their territories whereas uh, migrant hawkers can be seen in some numbers it's often seen in flight and does hover quite persistently the two yellow patches on the side of the thorax are not dissimilar to southern hawker but have a, uh, a more clear dark brown line dividing them the southern hawker tends to look yellower on the side looking more closely if you have one perched and they do perch up fairly frequently the markings on the top of the thorax are perhaps best described as uh, weak side lights they're hardly visible this species does have um, like the southern hawker a yellow golf tee pattern but the uh, tip of the abdomen lacks those um, completely blue lines across and there are a series of paired blue markings all the way down the abdomen female a browner yellower version of the male typically 
with very long appendages at the tip of the abdomen compared with other damsel, other hawker dragonflies. Rather similar, but found early in the season, so not a late season species, but one of the first, if not the first, dragonfly to emerge in spring. The hairy dragonfly is quite localised um, and much harder to find than, for example, the migrant hawker in late summer. It has a complex pattern in both the male and the female. Females are hairy, incidentally, on the not just the thorax, but the abdomen too, and this is where the name comes from, presumably an aid to it being an early uh, a spring emerging species, um, helping it to, to warm up on those cooler days. It uh, is very localised in Britain and Ireland, and typically associated with well-vegetated ditches and lakes, gravel pits, canals. It does have, um, like the skimmers incidentally, it has pale antinodal uh, veins, those yellowish veins and a yellowish costa too, and a, a rather more complex pattern of dark lines on the thorax. But this is the only um, small hawker you're going to see in the spring, generally speaking. Let's look briefly at fast flowing rivers and streams. We've already mentioned the beautiful demoiselle um, found here, but um, on, on these sorts of habitats. But one of the common dragonflies of running waters, at least in the west of Britain, is the large golden ringed dragonfly. So the typ typical markings of these are alternate broad and narrow bands of gold across the abdomen. Lovely green eyes, emerald green eyes. The female has a very long pointed ovipositor that protrudes beyond the end of her, her abdomen and in doing so um, gives her the accolade of being the longest British dragonfly. And she uses that to lay eggs into gravels at the bottom of a stream or river by a sort of pogo stick mo motion. So she jabs down vertically um, into the substrate repeatedly, rather like a sewing machine. And there's that localized distribution. A midsummer species and found principally in the West, commonest in the West. Up in the highlands, um, moorland and heathland bog pools with a lot of bog mosses, then we can expect uh, one of the commonest species to be the black darter. These do occur also on lowland heaths, but uh, is in decline, it seems, is in retreat moving northwards and up the um, up the contours onto higher land. It's um, a small, it is our smallest dragonfly, smaller than the common data, for example, all dark in the mature male with um, dark legs also. The female is rather richly yellow and black coloured quite a lot of black on the side of the abdomen there, and black legs again. She has uh, on the side of the thorax um, three um, yellow spots in a black panel, and on the top of the thorax, shown here, there's a black triangle mark, which is distinctive. There's the black panel on the side of the thorax. And as you can see, mainly northwestern in distribution, um, many of the records in the lowlands are from wandering individuals or even occasionally migrants on the coast. And it is a late species. It emerges in late July, found in uh, 
in late June rather, found in, in best numbers in July, August and into September. And as I said, it has been declining. So the uh, decline in occupancy there over that 50 year period, quite significant. Now, finally, the common hawker, which is unfortunately named because over much of the country, it actually isn't common. In fact, it's either absent or, or a wanderer, a rare wanderer. Moorland hawker is a much better name or perhaps Heathland hawker as they tend to be in acid boggy habitats. The male is a large hawker, about the same size as a southern hawker, so bigger than the migrant hawker, with which it's often unfortunately confused. And it has several distinguishing features, although you do need good views. And these can be hard because common hawker doesn't often perch, so you have to try and see them in flight. So first of all, and this may be difficult, they have a yellow wing vein, a yellow costa at the front of each wing. They have headlights, not particularly bright headlights, admittedly, but uh, quite clear stripes on top of the thorax. They have paired blue dots all the way down the abdomen, much like the migrant hawker. And they lack a yellow golf tee, just a little yellow streak there. Although again, that's going to be difficult to see in flight. The female is like other hawkers of this type, a dark brown and yellow color generally. And she has very faint headlights, I think it's fair to say. They have been in decline. So these late summer, early autumn species have apparently contracted quite significantly, a bit like the black darters have in the um, upland areas. They have retreated from the lowlands, it seems, and moved up uh, into the higher level moorlands. So it will be interesting to see what happens in the future as a milder climate, a warmer climate takes hold. OK, so a final word just about the British Dragonfly Society, um, with which I'm deeply involved and have been for many years. We have education and recording and conservation missions. We have a, a wonderful website. Please make use of it. The BDS keeps uh, a database of all dragonfly records. These eventually find their way onto the NBN Atlas and are hence available to anyone to download. Um, but you too can submit your sightings via iRecord and there's a, a link to iRecord via the Biological Record Centre's website address. Thank you very much for watching and listening.